Hello, Robert Bastian from Laryngopedia and Bastian Voice Institute. I want to talk to you about an idea that might help people who are experiencing terrible bouts of shortness of breath that nobody can explain. They say, I've been to my physician, I've done all the heart and lung tests, all the blood tests, all the oximetry, and nobody can find anything. Everything checks out just fine. And yet I'm left with this situation where now and again, unexpectedly, I could be sitting and reading a book, looking at my computer, I could be on a walk, I could be active or not active, and very abruptly, almost from one second to the next, I develop this, this feeling of air hunger, like I need air. So I respond, I take a deep breath, there's no noise, uh, meaning there's no obstruction, like a, or there's no noise, uh, everything comes in just fine, but I'm still left with that feeling of, of, of air hunger. Uh, well, <clears throat> what I want to explain is in the realm of ideation. Uh, so medicine mostly wants measurements and proof and, and numbers and all of that. But there are circumstances where you have to recognize something by its syndrome or by its phenomenology. And that's where we are here. To my knowledge, no one has ever described, and it's my term, the gasping syndrome. Um, and I, I think it's because there's, how would you publish? something that's purely in the conceptual realm or what I call ideation. It's not, um, you know, measured and, and proven in the t typical ways. So how do I, again, conceptualize this? Well, uh, what I think happens, and, and I'm, again, ideation, background is when human beings breathe, even if they're sitting for an hour or two, absolutely sedentary, every now and again they take a deeper breath than the rest of them. And the reason for that is the respiratory center sends us this subconscious message to do that because we need to keep our lungs expanded and they want to, the little air sacs uh, out deep in the lungs, they want to collapse if we breathe shallowly for a, a period of time, they want to collapse the little air, air sacs. And so we uh, are told, and don't realize it every now and again, to take a deep breath. So watch someone in the library reading a magazine, and you mo may notice that he or she shifts in, in the chair now and again, and at that same time they're taking a deeper breath. Watch someone sound asleep at night, and every now and again they'll mutter or stir or turn on their side. They don't remember it in the morning, but in addition they're taking a deep breath. Well, my conceptualization, and it's simply to sort of think about expanding our horizons about why might this person be short of breath, what I'm conceptualizing is that there is a sensory disturbance that's leading the person to, to experience that air hunger when there is no oxygen deficit. So uh, analogies would be those of you who've been to the dentist and had uh, injection to numb, say, in preparation for filling a cavity. Uh, I remember as a child, the first time that happened or the first time I remember it, I remember feeling like I must look like a freak because I remember thinking my, t my lip was sticking out and my tongue felt swollen. And I remember I must have gone into the bathroom or maybe when I got home in my small town and looking in the mirror and being sort of startled that what was so clearly the case, meaning that my lip was fat and sticking out, was not the case. I remember being quite surprised by that. Uh, in the same way, if your leg goes to sleep because of sitting cross-legged or whatever, that leg that is asleep feels fat and it feels heavy. And of course, it isn't fatter than the other one, and it isn't heavier, but that's a very strong uh, sensation that we get, that the leg is fat and heavy. Or think about the patient with diabetic neuropathy, damage of nerves in their feet, and they feel for all the world like there's a swarm of bees stinging their feet. And of course, nobody uh, imagines that they're actual bees stinging. We know that it's a sensory disturbance. 
Well, I've thought about that in the same way for this gasping syndrome, that imagine a circumstance where the person responds to the subconscious message, take a deep breath, out of, out of consciousness, and they do that, again, out of consciousness, but the brain, the respiratory center, doesn't get the message, okay, I did it. So the brain is going to send another message. It's going to be a little bit more insistent. Take that deep breath. If the message it doesn't somehow get back, I did it, then the brain will be even more insistent, and now it becomes conscious. We become aware of that message. Take a deep breath. Uh, so I think that's what, I mean, that's a, a way to conceptualize what may be happening. I know somebody who uh, had a, a treatment of a medication that had all kinds, it was an infusion, and it had all kinds of potential side effects, and one of them was a feeling of, sh of shortness of breath, and that person described this peculiar sensation that came on like a wave. Now, this is somebody without the gasping syndrome, but in the context of this infusion uh, for a cancer uh, problem, had this 20 or 30 seconds of remarkable sensation of smothering, like they just needed to take a deep breath, and then, you know, 20 seconds later, it was completely gone. So I think of that, that's a sensory disturbance. That person didn't have a uh, sudden deprivation of oxygen that lasted 20 seconds. They just had this sensory disturbance that was somehow induced by that uh, powerful medication. Well, w how do I use this concept clinically in the, in the clinic? Well, several times a year, I am sent somebody and I think the pulmonologist or primary care physician is wondering, is there a, an obstruction in the airway? But again, there's no noisiness or there's no prolongation. When they take a deep breath, they can do it very rapidly. There's no obstruction like you would have with a subglottic stenosis kind of situation. Um, and there's no sense of um, what we call secondary gain. Uh, once in a while, people develop issues because they need the, the loss of the disorder to help them uh, manage something else in their lives. It's, called, it's a non-organic or, or a psychogenic kind of disorder to handle stress or, or whatever. So I get none of that, uh, and yet I'm left with this highly distressed person who's, who's having these episodes of sudden air hunger uh, and again, remember, I'm talking about people who have had these extensive workups, heart and lungs, every test known to man, sometimes more than once. Well, if there's nowhere to go with it, because everything checks out fine, and maybe the person's only 40 years old, their valves have been checked, everything's been checked, scans and, and everything. What I say to them uh, sometimes is, well, some people have sensory disturbances that they have to neglect, they learn to neglect. Example, simple one would be contact lenses. You learn to neglect the feeling that there's a foreign body in your eyes. Tracheotomy, someone has a tracheotomy and how stimulating is that to the trachea? Uh, and yet, after they've worn a tracheotomy tube for a week or so, they become remarkably able to handle that sensation. Or think of the sword swallower who has to learn to neglect or uh, just accept the sensation of this sword going down in their throat. Or also imagine uh, the pearl diver who has to learn to uh, dive for pearls and neglect or ignore that sensation of air hunger. So that's one idea that we uh, give people with this gasping syndrome. The other idea we give them is the use of neuromodulators. So there are medications that are used for diabetic neuropathy or uh, neuralgia after shingles, for example, and those medicines work on nerve endings, sensory disturbances, things like amitriptyline, gabapentin, and so forth. So those are the two main approaches that we take. So am I telling you anything scientific or studied or proven? I don't know how anybody will ever be able to prove this kind of a, of a concept. There's, there's no way I can think of to, to make it scientific. 
So instead, I'm working in the area, again, of conceptual, of ideation, uh, to give you something to carry back maybe to your personal physician and say, is, could this be the problem? And uh, is, what do you think? What about seeing a neurologist or trying a neuromodulator? I'm trying to give you another idea if you're struggling with a feeling of desperation about these episodes of abrupt shortness of breath where you're taking these deep breaths but it's not solving your problem. And as an aside, if you want to read a description of the gasping syndrome, you can find it on Laryngopedia. Uh, here you see the entry. Go to laryngopedia.com and just type the word gasping into the search window right here, and you will find uh, that article. Thanks again for listening.